The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter diamond and the guests joining me here today, yes, there are two, to deep dive into Padua are a rare team in advice tech, a brother-sister duo, which is just wonderful. They have history in both learning and development and technical services and have really stayed true to their roots with their head office based in the gorgeous Kiama in New South Wales. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Anne-Marie and Matt Esler. Woo! Welcome. Thank you very much, Peter, for having us. It is a pleasure. Fantastic. Look, I'm Super excited to dive into all things Padua. There's so much there that I think we can unpack, uh, and I know the listener does too. But let's just get to know you a little better in your use of technology. Let's start with you, Anne-Marie. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do use emojis, Mm -hmm. although I'm very cognizant about what I use now, given the teen and the generation millennials that use different emojis for different things. Yep. For probably I would say my most used is have to be the smiley face. Oh, nice. Okay. Friendly. We love that. Friendly, yeah. friendly, yes. <laughs> How about you, Matt? What's your most used yeah, emoji? I, I, I was, uh, unfortunately, I'm very boring as well. Our, our mother um, it uses emojis for almost everything. So we'll leave the uh, dancing and, and uh, drinks emojis to her. But <laughs> my, mine would have to be the crying face because uh, I, I think I'm funny, but not everyone realizes I'm joking. So I've got to always put you know, I'm laughing out loud or tear, you know, crying up uh, emoji. Yep, I agree. Sometimes emojis are like soundtrack for a movie. It's a way to tell you how to feel, you know, so That's we know exactly. <laughs> what the tone is. You don't know. Exactly, exactly. I just said this, but take it to mean this. Exactly. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Exactly right. Exactly right. And Anne-Marie, how about if you, I mean, we're all so wed to our smartphones, aren't we? We're like, oh, my goodness. If you had to wipe all those apps off the phone, just keep three. Which three would you keep? I think I would have to go with WhatsApp, mm-hmm. Outlook to check my emails. That's really sad, I know. <laughs> and then probably the Facebook app. Nice. Okay. So keeping in touch with people broadly. Like that's your – yeah, fair enough. How about you, Matt? What do you think you'd keep? I, I just Not checked WhatsApp, my most recent no. <laughs> and my, most popular. So my most recent were the SBS On Demand app because the World Cup's on right now. Yes. And, uh, it's getting a lot of airplay. Uh, I, I imagine that would usually be switched out for Fox Sports or something like that, uh, or maybe um, Sports Bet because I'm into my uh, horse racing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but probably the other two are Audible and uh, Airbnb for a bit of travel. Yeah, nice. We've um... much more interesting than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt's like, yeah, I don't want to keep in touch with you guys. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not traveling. I'm, I, I don't have to worry about the emails because I know Emery's got that covered. Exactly. <laughs> I love the combination. It's fantastic. (laughs) All right. Let's dive into Padua, shall we? So let's sort of start high level. 
Um, and just for those who maybe aren't aware of the tool, I'm sure most are, but, you know, where does it sit in the advice tech space? What category do you sort of fall under? Who are you broad, com- you know, lined up against that sort of, co- let's give everybody a feel for where it sits. Yeah, it's kind of a really interesting space that we sit in from a tech perspective. So advice is our focus. Um, we're all about increasing the accessibility and affordability of advice, which is, you know, the QAR consultation paper was was very close to our hearts, I guess. Yep. So in terms of who we compete with, we don't really compete with the traditional financial planning software applications that, right. that are usually CRM based, right? Uh, but tend to also include things like portfolio management, practice management, commission systems, um, client engagement um, components or yep. applications. Yep. Um, so Pedro specifically focuses on advice from a software perspective. So what we've done is sort of break down that advice piece down into um, component parts again. So yep. at each stage of the advice process, we, we've sort of developed a, um, a piece of software that, that relates to that. So we've got Home, which is where we sort of pull data in from existing um, um, CRM systems. Yep. And then we've got Discover, which is where we do um, the fact find and, and update data that's probably not prevalent in the CRM or may not be there. Right. Uh, and then we've got Compare, which is our product comparison uh, technology. And then we've got Recommend, which is where the advisor makes their new recommendations. Yeah. And then we've got Review, where advisors can go in and do their um, their review documents uh, and, and planning. So we sort of look at it from that perspective. And it's interesting, we... At, you know, Emery will talk more about the tech enabled services side, but uh, that part of it is really interesting in the sense that no one else really does that in the industry in terms of having a services division and a software division, right? Where the services are full of technical and advice experts who inform our tech, yep, and then our tech is making our advice generation more efficient for our services team, so they're becoming more scalable and more efficient. But it's actually this virtuous cycle that's going on where. You know, I think they used to talk about eating our own dog food, but we've upgraded that now <laughs> to drinking our own champagne. <laughs> our software makes our services more scalable and our services enhance the functionality and capability of the software. So yeah, okay. we, we, we've, we've really enjoyed that mix. And, you know, Emery described this before as sort of saying um, when it comes to the services side, that's really um, Emery's domain and my domain is more on the software side. But we're sort of trying to bridge that more and more where it's, um, we, we're crossing over into into each other's and sort of more running it um, together. We used to run it more separately, but now we're running it more as, as co-CEOs together. Nice. And so, Anne-Marie, does that mean that um, the list of, of system requests is big bigger from your team than maybe externally? You know, like your, your team are the ones that are like, ah, we need this updated because it's not quite what we need or this would improve processes. Is that generally, oh, is that almost the hope for you guys that that's where a lot of the upgrades come from? That's exactly the case, yeah. Peter, um, because our team are using the software day in, day out, you know, every minute of every day even, and so they're continually providing feedback to the technology team and they're continually coming up with new ideas and solutions and, and things that can maybe improve the process and, and the experience for the end user, which can either be our advisor clients or, as we said, our internal users. Yeah, okay. And that's, that's sort of... Um that that magic where a provider or a, t- a tool knows you better than you know yourself, like that's magic. When you can get to that point where you guys come up with a solution, you're like, I didn't even realize I needed it. You know, like it's, <laughs> that's actually fantastic because it gets a bit tiring when we're the ones always asking for stuff, you know, as advisors. Like you're just like, oh, really? So you guys clearly, if, you know, you'll be on the edge of that. You'll be on the on the cusp of, well, the next great thing would be, which is exciting, right? And it yeah, probably and gives the, you a bit of a head start. That's right. The advisors give us a lot of input as well. So, mm. uh, and we set up sort of focus groups and beta testing with the advisors and things like that. Um, but you know, where the advisor may be apprehensive about um, um, giving you constructive feedback, let's call it, <laughs> uh, our own staff are not uh, at all shy <laughs> about coming forward on that front, Peter. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and look, you you do set that tone. That's about how you run a business too, isn't it? Where you can encourage people to just look, let us have it because that's where you get the gems. And in, and it's often from places you might not expect. It might be more junior people using the tool who just point out, I don't get why this is hard. You're like, oh, yeah, it probably shouldn't be hard. You know, so it's it's fantastic. That feedback loop is is really powerful. What made you guys go down this path with Patrick? Like what, what 
on God's earth possessed you. No, 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 no. <laughs> Delusion <laughs> and insanity are the two the two words that Delusions come to mind. Delusions of grandeur. Yeah. <laughs> how did this start? How did you how did you embark on this? What was the driving force? Okay. Stunned so- into silence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> What the driving force? Uh, the driving force was that we saw a need, you know, in the industry, and it's these are the things that have been talked a lot yep. recently, and so that is the time taken to produce advice. You know, it can take two to six hours for review, two to six hours to produce a review document, eight to twelve for a simple SOA, and fourteen to thirty hours for a more complex SOA, yeah. which is way too long. So that was the first issue we wanted to solve. The second one was the cost taken to produce advice. Mm. The costs are increasing for the advisors to produce the advice and then the clients paying for the advice. So we wanted to address that issue as well. The quality of the advice, which is, you know, all about the quality of the advice review at the moment yep. and the need in the industry to increase that and to produce good advice. And lastly, engagement and trust. So that client advisor relationship and how we can really improve that relationship so that the client is getting the best experience out of seeing a financial advisor and receiving quality of advice in a timely manner that's cost effective as well. Yeah. And look, and I think it's an interesting, there's a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which is by a guy who actually um, years ago reviewed the way surgeons operated. And this was before they were as structured as they are now and managed to massively reduce the deaths um, due to surgery. And it was because of this structure that they produced about constantly checking what they're doing. And I think in advice, there is a lot of personalization that goes on, but also there's only actually so many permutations of strategies. Like there is is actually not a never-ending list. There is a, a given list. We, and- we, we hope to change that, Peter. We'll talk about that more <laughs> later. But Amory and I also come from a technical background. Yeah. So in our, in our infancy, um, we were providing strategic advice to advisors on the best – uh, technical, technical strategies to yeah. provide their their clients, and yeah. what we've seen over the last few years, and we've been, interestingly we've we've got the data on this because we produce um, thousands of advice documents each month. We're seeing the number of strategies actually narrow down, mm-hmm. and actually the number of platforms and in, and products that advisors are advising on are, is expanding quite dramatically. And yeah, and and this comes down to um, how hard it is to provide high quality strategic advice at the moment. Yep. It's also, I think, is, is the platform or product side is, I think, linked to this idea of trying to move away from vertically integration yes. or vertically aligned um, products. And so we've seen a huge proliferation of the number of platforms being been advised on, but equally, the number of strategies is decreasing quite, quite dramatically. And it's actually a scary thought. So uh, part of what we're aiming to do is really enable advisors to be able to provide high quality and re- very strategic advice easily to clients and really expand the um, strategic element because, you know, alpha and beta are uncertain, yep. but delta, which is what we describe as the the tax and, and, and superannuation and social security benefits that advisors can provide to clients is known and, yep. and certain. And I think coming back to sort of the question around, you know, what we're trying to do, one of the, one of the big things that we, we always have talked about and, and uh, more recently when we brought on strategic investors, the, 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 the thing around accessibility and the number of um, Australians actually paying for advice, it's around 10%. So about 2.6 million Australians pay for advice. Yeah. But there's actually 10 million or, or over 40% that want it. Mm. Um, so we've obviously seen a, a huge decline in, in the supply of advice. So yeah. authorised reps have, have gone from nearly 28,000 in 2018 to around 16,000 yeah. now. So there's been a 40% decline in the number of ARs in the industry. So if you think about it from a supply and demand perspective, there's never been a greater time to be a financial advisor, <laughs> yeah. really. So Pedro is solving the time, cost, quality, engagement sort of problem that yeah. Amory talked about that's plagued the industry for a long time. But if you think about what the future holds um, and, and the fact that, you know, um, Pedro is sort of looking at um, solving those key issues for advisors to enable life to be even prettier, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty pretty bright future for, for financial advisors given that supply demand equation and, and given that some of these big problems that have been problems for years and years and years are now being solved. I agree. And I think um, taking on, you know, taking further your point about the strategies and the, the advisors have narrowed that down. My point being that even if there was 400 we had to consider, right, even if there was a possible list of 400, from a tech perspective, 
that's not hard to prompt us on as we go through a process, right? So even if it feels a lot to us as individuals, from a tech sense, we can be walked through something that narrows it down and then we fine tune it, you know, whereas that's not actually where tech has been before. Like it was very much us pushing the strategy into the tech, if you know what I mean. It was absolutely. All that, whereas to me, and maybe this is my actuary brain, but there's a lot that just through almost filtering, you can knock them out. Nope, you know, too old, too young, too, you know, whatever the whatever the elements are uh-huh. and you can narrow it down. But what it does mean, which I love, is it's going to remind you that you've missed that one. Have you thought about that last one? Because it might just be worth looking at, you know, like that ability to just catch those extra elements that we're human beings. We can't necessarily always be perfect in that sense, but a, a system can help us be. Absolutely. You know? And 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 I think it's a great point. And you mentioned your actuarial background and now <laughs> I, I know why I love you. Peter. <laughs> so I guess the, um, the, the thing for us is, you know, and we've, been, we've been saying this to to um, our investors and, and lay people who probably don't understand financial advice so well. Imagine going to see your accountant and them being able to tell you every re, uh, rebate, offset, concession, deduction available to you. Now, they can't do it. Uh, and the, answer, the reason why they can't do it is that they're human. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what we've been building is this capability that takes the digital information collected in the, the client fact find and then we've applied that to the legislation and regulations so that um, we will understand or help the advisor understand client eligibility. Right. So you can take the, the you know, it's, it's going to be over 600 um, strategies by the time we release this podcast. So I'll say there's sort of 600 strategies and then it gets truncated down by eligibility. It gets truncated down further by what the client's objectives are. Right. And then truncated even further again by the scope of the advice that your advisor is providing. Yeah. But being able to actually identify all of the strategies that the client's eligible for is an amazing first step. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about that from an accountant point of view, I would be so happy if my accountant could do that. But obviously, they can't do that. They are always <laughs> very, you know, vague and blasé when it comes to um, whether or not I'm going to get the maximum deduction av- av- available or, or maximum refund. Yeah. And, and so... You know, being able to apply that to a financial advisor is hugely important, and particularly for your ensemble uh, advisors who tend to be that younger generation coming through because they're more, more social media savvy and, and whatnot. Uh, and for the PI, uh, the PY advisors particularly, yes. imagine entering an industry and having the same technical capacity as a twenty-year or thirty-year veteran, and, yeah. and that's basically what we're going to be providing. And and that comes back to the technical. Uh, roots and, yeah. and and you know Anne Marie um, went from technical into power planning and I went technically into software and basically bringing those back together so we've got this platform that enables advisors to generate advice really really quickly and efficiently but of a really high quality and strategic nature exactly and the thing is um it's the it's always the most complicated part or the the technically complicated, but honestly, it's not the hardest. The hardest is the human behavior. So to have a tool that enables you to do the technical part well, so you can, you know, really focus on the fact they're going to do something stupid, you know, down the track or, or react to markets or whatever it might be. I think that's empowering advisors the right way. You know, and, and we're going to need that balance, aren't we? When we've we've lifted education standards, we've done all these things which are all awesome, but the flip side of that is you can produce a whole lot of very technically focused advisors who don't necessarily have the people skills. So to almost take that pressure off and go, okay, the tech, tech is going to be covered. You need to be smart. You need to be able to work through it, but we've got you covered. Now you're going to have to get your EQ sorted. I like that as a balance, you know, to to bring sort of more – um, well-balanced advisors out, you know, out of the process. And you're right for a PY advisor, a young advisor to have something that it's sort of taking them down the bouncy ball, isn't it? They just learn these great behaviours and these ways to look at things um, that's powerful. Engineers have been doing that for years. They have these really structured ways. They learn how to build, design, all that sort of stuff. But we've not really had that. We're not really trained that way in advice, um, you know, where there's this sort of given ways that you approach a given thing to make sure you don't miss anything. You make sure you're bridge doesn't fall down you know <laughs> yeah and i think that's part of the reason and emory will talk more about this but that combination of the tech and the humans that we've got at pedro and the advisor actually being able to lean on a human at the same time the tech is helping them with the technical heavy lifting and all that structural stuff that you mentioned yeah um the humans can actually help with okay let's understanding more of the the, the soft school side of things you know 
understanding the client objectives and then applying what what strategies might be best to suit those objectives, which, yeah. you know, um, uh, if you look at it purely on what technical strategies a client's eligible for, you then need that subjective sort of discussion around what are the trade-offs because, you know, there might be a particular strategy that gives the highest outcome, but is that most relevant? Emery, do you want to talk to that a little bit? Well, I was actually going to jump in and say, as Peter mentioned, most of the technology that's available at the moment requires the advisor to put all of the inputs in yeah. and for him to know what they kind of want to recommend in terms of the end strategy. Yeah. Whereas the difference with our technology is that it will provide you with all of the solutions that are that the client is eligible for. And then, as Matt said, the advisor and the client can then have that discussion around what are the trade-offs. Mm. So you're actually eligible, Mr. and Mrs. Client, for these 10 or 12 strategies. Right. Let's now explore each of them and think about which one you would prefer to go with. And it's that behavioural and personal touch and that client engagement side that the advisor can then spend more time, as we said, focusing on because the technology has done all the heavy lifting yeah. and it's narrowed and done that big filter, taken all of those incredible number of options or strategies that are available and filtered them all down depending on the exact criteria that the client has and their eligibility for each of those strategies. And then the client and the advisor can just discuss, yeah. well, you know, you could do this and that's the outcome or you could do this other option and then you have a different outcome. And it's then up to you to decide which you prefer. Yeah. Like, I think that's you know, that's a really important part of what this technology can can pr- provide. And it's a unique thing for the way we need to deal with clients. I mean, we, you know, you were talking before about accountants and and there's a number of times I've had a client, you know, ask about something that maybe their accountants flagged and, and I'll ask the question, gee, what have they suggested it'll save? And, you know, oh, it'll be $200 a year and what's it going to cost you to do that? It'll be $1,000 in fees. Like, you know, it's that, it's right. that sort of logic applied to go, yes, this thing exists and it's mathematically optimized, but is it appropriate and realistic? You know, so, <laughs> and that's where the human comes in. And also, are they going to do it? Are they going to want to revisit something every year? Are they going to, you know, all of that is the layers of of your human behavior over the top. But to have the other covered, where it's sort of just look, here is the collage of all the different things we can consider. Let's just pull them in. Let's take a look um, and get, you know, the right outcome for you as an individual or even as a family, you know, whatever works for them, uh, which is exciting. So in terms of then the users, is it really just advisors with maybe power planners or do you get support team in, in the tool? What Who are your normal users for the app? Yeah, so definitely advisors and all of their teams, so support advisors, client service officers okay. are all interacting with our technology and using the technology. Um, so definitely they're our primary users. Yeah, okay. And yeah, when you, I should mention as well, so we, we sort of run two tech-enabled services. So on the power planning side, that's definitely the case. On the transition side, it's actually platforms that are um, we're mostly engaging with okay. because we're actually helping them and, and assisting with, with transitions onto certain platforms. Mm-hmm. And and I guess more recently, if you think of, you know, um, what other users have, have sort of come out more recently, when when we built this sort of um, system, we realized that not only does it do, you know, 600 um, or so strategies, uh, it covers IntraFund beautifully. Right. Uh, and so having IntraFund, and we call it IntraFund Plus or IntraPlus because, you know, whilst the super funds can advise on intra strategies which of which there's sort of five broad categories yep um they also are now engaging advisors to provide the additional is the plus side i guess peter so yeah. um and, and we've built the infrastructure so that um the platforms or the super funds can actually work with advice groups as well right so a lot of the more progressive industry funds who are now working with advisors are working with Padua, uh and you're seeing so that it's a bit of a mix so you know the the business as usual stuff for the core of our business, um, um, the power planning services, certainly it's the advisors and, and the power planners and support stuff. And interestingly, on that side, we actually work a lot with um, hybrid sort of arrangements right. where you've got internal power planning and, and Pedro is a, is a hybrid outsource. Yep. Um, so we actually give them our tech infrastructure that makes our power planning really efficient. And we give that to their internal team as well so yep. that they're as efficient as we are. And all the reporting can be done through the one system or whatnot. And then on the transition side, it's the platforms and, and, and super funds. And then on the interest side, of course, it's it's super. But then which advice groups they've engaged to provide that additional level of, of, of advice to their members that 
may not be covered with intra. Yeah, okay. And so that's really interesting. And so I'm guessing that um, there's a lot of – so clearly the advisors – you must deal with dealer groups though too because I'm, I'm betting that sometimes you guys come across f- for a whole dealer group. Um, and so that must have its own challenges because, of course, dealers dealer groups have their own agendas and things they need to check off versus the individual users. So how do you manage that? Like how do you <laughs> – because you clearly are sitting right in the advisor's chair. Right? I mean it, it's firmly in there in the power planner's chair. So how do you manage that sort of dynamic and, and a bit of tension, I guess, between you know those parties when you get them to come on as part of, say, a bigger group? So we definitely have – a better experience overall when we are working very closely with the dealer group. Yep. And that's where we can have some really great relationships because the dealer group can, you know, approve Padua's use of our technology and our sort of power planning or transition management services across the whole dealer group. Right. And once that approval has been granted, and sometimes that's a tough process to have to go through because there's <laughs> a lot of compliance checks and, and other checks that the um, dealer group would do. Um, but once we've completed all of those, it makes a relationship so much easier. And right. we can then go to all of the advisors under that dealer group and work with them each individually, knowing that they have the support of their dealer group and knowing that they can move ahead with us. Yeah. It means then that we have regular meetings with those dealer groups. So we may commit with the compliance team. We can meet with the technology team. We're continually updating our templates to reflect the requirements of that dealer group so that we're kept up to date as well. Okay. Um, but it is definitely more involved, but it gives us access to more advisors under that dealer group. So yeah. when it works well, it's really positive. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, I think. Because, it is. <laughs> um, you know, a, a, as you've mentioned as well, there's, there's some, there's some you know, conflicting sort of things going on in the sense that, um, you know, Padra by its very essence is, is, is helping advisors generate high quality advice. Right. Um, and the licensee requirements are, you know, compliance and professional standards related mm. And we are adhering to those compliance requirements of the dealer, and and not every practice and advisor tends to agree with that, right? right? But then it's the practice that's paying Pedro rather than the dealer. So <laughs> yep. it's all it's it's a really interesting dynamic. And as Emery mentioned, we we like to go through this process of authorizing dealers, right? Uh, so we 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 won't necessarily let a dealer just come on with Pedro. Yep. they've actually got to satisfy some of our requirements as well. Yep, which is a bit of a change for them, but. Um, you know, uh, they've got to ensure that the API and their CRM connectivity is good. They've got to ensure that they've got their research and their professional standards updated properly because these are the parameters within which we need to work. And and so, you know, there's some really great authorized dealers that we work with. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some others that are coming up to speed um, in that process. Yeah. But certainly it's it's gathering a lot more momentum um, than previously. We, we were previously focused on certain groups that we knew had those standards and had right. those criteria, but we would say that it's getting better and better across across the um, uh, sort of smaller and mid-sized um, licensees. Well, and I think um, particularly if what you're introducing is something that gives things gives the advice process more rigor, you know, that's something that will actually lift their game anyway, just by default of using the tool. You know, so so I like that idea of you guys delivering, even though you're you're serving a need, which is the advice process, it's also elevating the sort of um, quality and, you know, the compliance elements anyway, merely because of the approach you're taking um, that sort of, you know, gives that almost feedback. It's that feedback loop almost. Um, and that's a great learning ground, you know, for for somebody to go, well, why the hell is that? Does that keep on coming up and the things I should be considering? All right, I need to learn some more. Like I think we're in the industry often we're very afraid of admitting what we don't know, but by very definition of what phase year requires, we've got to know what we don't know. You know, we've really got to know ourselves well. So I can see how the tool could help with that. It's like, wait a minute, I need to get some more education on this. You know, clearly I need to understand that strategy better, which is powerful um, and it, it will lift the quality definitely. In terms of the practices that it works well with, we'll sort of cover what you see and what you think it, it really, like when you guys go in, how it really embeds. But I am a bit curious, are any of the practices that use the tool but not Amory, your services, do they sometimes they use you as like an overflow service? Is anybody doing that where they're sort of like, no, we've got an in-house person we use but – when, you know, Bedlam hits and there's all these clients at once, they therefore, because they're already in the tool, it makes it easier for them to use you guys. Is that something that people do? Mm, definitely. Okay. And what we've seen in some instances is that we actually ha- have given our software to the internal power planning team and the internal power planning team receive the requests from all their advisors through our software and then they allocate to either 
their internal power planning team or to Padua. Okay. So the power planning manager will have a look at the request and then decide which way it will go, whether internal or if they're too busy or if it's too complex or whatever it is, they might decide to send it to the Padua team and then we will then allocate it to yeah. our internal power planners. Then it goes back to, you know, we go through our whole process, which is we haven't covered yet, but that <laughs> involves a number of different steps. And then it comes back to their internal Padua, like power planning manager yep. to then distribute back to their advisor. Yeah, nice. Okay, so it's um, so that's interesting. So it's not just sort of surge resource allocation. It could also be skills based. Like it could be, hey, this this one came up. You know what? We're going to send it to you guys just from a, a you know the complexity of it or something like that. That we feel that you could add some value. That's interesting. So it's a um, <clears throat> that's a really powerful way to ensure you sort of got all bases covered for the practice. Um, is exactly. to do that sort of funneling through a center point, and that person can allocate accordingly, which is probably. It's probably not something that's innate to a lot of advice practices is looking at their processes that way, you know, like that resource allocation way. Often we're a bit linear, aren't we, in advice? It's like starts there and then it goes there and then it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say it gives that optionality. Yeah. And so advisors can then sort of focus on what what do I do best and which part of the process am I going to add the most value? Yeah. Or which part of the process do we want to insource versus outsource? Yeah. Uh, it really does give a lot of flexibility to the to the practice or the licensee. And it's funny too, Peter, you, and I said too that we, you know, the, the Padua, the internal team might outsource for Padua for the complex. We've actually got advisor practices that do the opposite as right. well. The internal power planners want to keep all of the complex strategy <laughs> stuff to the themselves. The juicy stuff. Yep. Yeah, the that's right. The juicy stuff that they want to do and they say, we want to send you all the really quick, simple things <laughs> yeah. and you do the high volume work and we'll keep the big ones for ourselves. So it's interesting that it can go either way. Yeah, it's quite balanced actually uh, on that front because it's right. You know, I'm a power planner for a reason. I want to. I want to do the. I don't want to just submit plans to you guys to do. I want to actually get involved and, and get my get my uh, hands steady. Right, and it's a. It's a. I love the idea of of getting. A, I guess it's really a principal rather than the advisor, but a principal to really think about the strengths and weaknesses of their team, but also what do they want to work on. Like really, what do we, what do you love? Let's double down on that and let's outsource the other, you know? And so like that's already happening, I think, with admin. People are getting more comfortable with that sort of support. But I love this idea where, hey, if you just want the easy stuff to just get done and you don't have to think about it and you love the, you know, the complex, layered, many, you know, strategy stuff, then great, hold on to that. Or if the reverse is the case, um, you know, that's powerful and, and it's going to build um, more – to be honest, more niched practices because they'll work out exactly who they want to deal with and, and why, and then you guys can fill the gap, you know, depending on on what they need, you know, in, the, in, in those differences. So I really like that as an idea. So is there anything before somebody comes on? Well, actually, before we start that, Anne-Marie, I feel like we need to understand a bit better how you, your team engages with a practice so that we can sort of see the big picture. So talk us through what that experience is like. How do, what are the steps that they take? All right. So the steps that they would take is that the first step is we connect to many CRMs. Yep. Um, and so they would be pulling their data from their CRM into our online fact find mm-hmm. called Discover, and that starts the process. And they can either then update that themselves. If it's not updated, they can send it to the client to update various sections of it if it's not updated. Or alternatively, it will just produce an exceptions report to see where the gaps are. Yep. That's something that our technology can do that not a lot of other fact finds can do is show you where you're missing right. information. And so once that's been completed, then they'll move through that data, will pull through into the advice request form or recommend yep. our software tool. So the advisor then will have all the existing situation already preloaded and then they'll put in their recommendations for the for the client. Yep. Um, and obviously that's guided by the technical and the legislative and the compliance parameters yep. and the client eligibility. And then once that request is received by the Padua team, each of our advisor groups um, have a team of quality assurance managers and power planners that work with them. So the quality assurance managers review that advice request form yep. and all the information that's being provided. And that could include additional uploaded documents, um, but mainly the advice request form that has come through from that recommend that they've completed online. They'll review that and they'll send them a strategy confirmation to say, this is what you're recommending. 
this is the second recommendation, this is the third one, these are the platforms that you're recommending. And they may make suggestions, you right. know, would you like to increase the contributions because the client is eligible or would you like to, um, you know, are you going to use that platform or that platform? And, you know, there might be a bit of discussion around the strategies and the platform. Yep. They'll send that confirmation back through our software again to the advisor. The advisor will tick, tick, proceed, proceed. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. And please do this or please do this or I'm meeting with the client in five days' time. Please have it back by then. <laughs> yeah. And then the SOA advice document is is allocated to a power planner. The power planner will work on that document. They might ask additional questions if required through our SIF software again. So it's all in the one spot. Mm-hmm. It's all date and time tracked, every communication, every step along the way and then they do a review of what they've done it goes to a peer they complete a review checklist then it goes back to the quality assurance manager so this is our three-step review process yep quality assurance manager will review that advice document against all of the information that's been provided and then it's completed back to the advisor nice so that's the full power planning process it's slightly different on the transition management side but that's That's our sort of tech-enabled power planning service process. And I'm imagining your internal check process is, an well, aside from making sure the quality is good, is an effort to minimise the amount that the advisor loops back again. So it's like a catch to get this thing as slick as it possibly can be so that the advisor is like, great, I'm just going to use that. Like it's it's not because I know that people struggle sometimes with power planning outsourcing and they feel like they go backwards and forwards. So I'm betting that's part of what you're trying to do there is really get it to the point that the advisor is going to be ecstatic with the outcome. Ideally, we yeah. would love to send back, you know, a 100% completed document. Yeah. And as you say, that's the whole idea of collecting all of the information up front, get, making sure we have a complete look at what the client situation is now and then all of the recommendations and they're 100% confirmed by the advisor. All the questions are asked up front so we have everything that we need. We produce the document and as much as possible, the advisor should just be able to read through it and tick, tick, it looks okay, and send it off to the client. Yeah, yeah. Or have their client meeting and go through it with them. It's interesting. Advisors and compliance managers have, have never seen eye to eye. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when you have a system that advisors love and equally compliance managers rave about, you've you've, you've reached the holy grail. Yeah. And so uh, it was interesting. We, I actually presented um, to, a, to a new compliance manager of a fairly large um, dealer recently, and at the end of this, she said, this is like 10-pin bowling with the guardrails up. Advisors <laughs> can't make a mistake from a compliance point of view when they're using this technology. And I thought, wow, that's awesome because we know how much the advisors love it. Yeah. But if you can get advisors and compliance managers agreeing something, yeah. that's that's a, that's a special moment. And, but, it, but- and it's the thing is it shouldn't be surprising it's possible, right? I, I think that's that's the shift we all need to have, I think, about advice production as opposed to giving advice, advice production, it just didn't need to be as hard as it always was. We just, the tech just wasn't keeping up, you know? So we always built up the advice production as the hardest part when in reality, with some great tools, with some structure, like clearly that's what you also have is this structured way of approaching it and what a difference that makes. Then the real hard part is getting the client to do it, right? Exactly. And getting them to stick to the plan. That's actually what's hard. But we got so caught up in this difficult, complex, layered, messy thing that we were doing. And so I love the fact that we can almost be liberated from that a bit, you know, that it's right, this is sorted. I mean, the you know, I'm thinking about that process, Emery, you're describing there with briefing, you know, from outsourced power plans. I get asked about those sort of things all the time. And and one of the things I always say to the advisors is, yes, but are you expecting them to be psychic? Like how good is your brief? Because the outcome is only as good as your brief is, you know? So I'm betting that because of the way you both get the data and what you ask them as part of that sort of submission is trying to make the brief as high quality as it can be so that there are very little questions for your team. And, and, and taking risk off the financial advisor and the licensee, you know, we, when we pull the data in from the CRM, it actually tells the advisor and the licensee and the client what information was pulled in from the from the CRM. Yep. And then what update what <laughs> data was updated by the client, what data was updated by the advisor. So that risk is is alleviated. Yeah. And then what data was actually pushed back into the CRM. So to close the loop, we actually push all of that back to the CRM and the, and the CRM is is the source of truth. And I think if you look at traditional financial planning software, you know, advice is complex, okay? 
uh, and an advice practice is complex and all the things that financial planning software tries to achieve. You know, I mentioned it before, the CRM, practice management, portfolio <laughs> management, commission system, um, client portal or client engagement. Yeah. You know, the list goes on, you know, e- even trying to get out FDSs and things like that. You know, so the, the software is trying to do too much in yeah. our view. We, we, we deliberately and specifically focused on advice. Yeah. We, we let everyone else worry about CRM and portfolio management and practice management and all those <laughs> sorts of things. Yeah. But there's no one really just focused on specializing on advice generation and, and how to make advice, um, high quality advice, um, be able to produce in a timely manner at a, at a low cost, which is, you know, th- those two things are tied together. Mm. But then also taking the client on the journey, you know, being able to produce advice quickly and effectively with its high quality means that you can actually do more scenarios, which means right. that you can engage the client on those trade-offs that Emery mentioned before, where it's, do you want to do this or do you, would you like us to do this or we could do it this way or we could do it that way? At the moment, um, and previously, uh, you know, up to this point, <coughs> advisors haven't been able to do that because it takes so long <laughs> for advisors and their power planners to produce a financial plan using traditional methods uh, that there was no way they could do options. There was no way they could talk about multiple scenarios yeah. because just doing the one scenario was taking days. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that trade-off discussion and having those really good conversations, and if you think about, you know, how clients have been engaged traditionally, it's a classic. And, you, and, and, and advisors go, why, why is my advice not trusted? Well, it's pretty obvious. When you look at the client experience through the advice process, client comes in to see you in the fact fire meeting. You scribble down on a piece of paper as frantically as possible <laughs> because you need to then hand that fact file and, and whatever additional notes you've got to the power planner. The power planner jumps on these Starship Enterprise financial planning software applications, <laughs> which are really blank canvas, you know, um, modeling capabilities. Yeah. Where you're starting from scratch, you're building out this massive plan for this client. Days and weeks are going by. The client doesn't know what's going on. They haven't heard anything they're they're waiting and waiting and waiting and often you know we've we've actually taken over um power planning from internal power planning teams where the the delay in time from the fact find meeting to the advice being handed back to the client was up to a hundred and over a hundred days wow can you imagine that? You, yeah. I would have forgotten. If I was the advisor, I would have forgot what the client looked like. So, <laughs> But it's not just the advisor, and, right? And, and the client's I mean, forgotten as well. <laughs> the client loses momentum. I, I remember Absolutely. doing a session. It was only a couple of years ago for advisors and we were talking about this, you know, short, shortening the time and the momentum clients have. And when they're interested in something, they're all excited and they'll get things back to you and then they lose momentum. They're like, oh, but, you know, it's important. Surely they should be focused. I'm like, all right, well, who's bought a couch recently? You know, there's a number of people. Yep. So you go to the store and you find the one you love and you pick the color and then they tell you what's going to take eight weeks to deliver. How do you feel? You know, and if they're anything like me, it's like, I don't want that catch. No, I want the one that's going to arrive tomorrow. Like, that's <laughs> right, right. Because we're in the moment, we've got momentum. And I think it does, it actually makes the, the whole process more expensive just because the follow ups have to be more often. And then the, you know, then it's hard to get the form back. And then it's hard, like it, it stretches everything out, you know, and totally. your conversion drops significantly. Um, so being able to convert, you know, being able to, get that plan back within a week is, yeah. is really important to us and yeah. we are constantly chipping away at the time it takes to get that plan back to the advisor uh, notwithstanding the fact that at the same time we're increasing the quality of advice and bringing the cost down as well yeah so usually when you tick a time box or you tick a cost box or you tick a quality box you normally have to give up one of the others that's yeah. the classic in any business in any industry anywhere and and I, I guess what we're trying to do is is ensure all three of those at the same time. And if you think about, you know, the other thing that's really important to us is that it's Australian owned, Australian operated, everything's on shore, everything's high quality. And advisors sometimes forget, you know, you, you, you might pay less to go offshore, but but you actually you're forgetting how much you are valued and how much your time is valuable because the amount of back and forth that needs to happen with those right. sort of operations is incredible. Definitely. And being able to lift it to a standard where your clients are going to accept is also incredible. Yeah. Um, and no matter what anyone says to me about how good it is in the Philippines or in Vietnam or whatever, whichever other country, nothing's as good as unbelievably technical experts here in Australia who know the law, they know the regulations, they know the legislation, they can actually have meaningful conversations and, and be better at providing strategic advice than the actual advisor needing to do that because if you think about 
go back to what the advisor's value proposition is. Their value proposition should be about understanding the client, understanding their needs and objectives. Yeah. It shouldn't be about being a technical expert. Right. But, you know, if they are, that's great. You'll have more meaningful conversations with the guys at Pedro who are technical experts and do have that strategic experience. Yeah. And there is a difference in it. You know, the word power planning gets thrown around a lot in the industry and people mean very different things by that. You know, And in fact, I think a lot of them, what they're actually saying is word document production. Like it's not actual power planning, you know, because if you do the equivalent law paralegals, they do a lot of research, like they go out and do the research. They're the ones that actually go out, like you're saying, the strategy, like digging out all this information and pulling it together and thinking through the strategies and then come back to the lawyer with a, hey, this is what I discovered. But they're that technically focused, you know, and and power planning, really, that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be somebody deeply technical you know, who uh, can really dig through that. And yes, maybe they produce the document, but the fact that they do, it should just be something that a, a, a tech service can do. You know, the actual document itself shouldn't be the focus of the, the power planner. You know, that's that's actually more down PA world, you know, where somebody can produce a document. You know, so I think we've got to think about the language we use when we're talking about these services, because I do think some people think it's just, oh, aren't they merging something in Word? No, <laughs> it's much more than that. A good power planner or power planning service. Yeah. You've opened up a, a Pandora's box oh, here, <laughs> think that's so I'll let everybody go. <laughs> I was just going to say one of the services that we offer all of our advisors is the strategy meeting. So the advisor can pick up the phone to their quality assurance manager and have a discussion around the types of strategies they're thinking about suggesting and, and the quality assurance manager can work through some of those options right. and yep. discuss and bounce ideas and, you know, look at the client situation and, and sort of make suggestions and recommendations that the advisor can can then think about so, nice, nice, and that dynamic that's element, <laughs> right? And 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 we all we all learn more from those interactions. I think that's the other thing that you know, as advisors, we probably don't get as much op- opportunity as as we need or should want to do those conversations where you're almost debating something. Like it's a you know, and that's where you actually learn. We don't learn from reading a book about something. You know, it's it's those deeply rich, and it, and actually, it can also help you discover another. Well, what we could do is look at it from this angle. And, you know, the two heads better than one sort of approach. So that's really powerful, actually, and I think could be really appealing um, to some advisors, particularly if they're maybe on their own or a small team. You know, that's that's really valuable. And I think that's the, the other important thing, you know, putting a team around the advisor as well. You know, if you've got an in-house power planner, you've got two heads. Yeah. Um, with a team that, the, you know, we put two quality assurance managers in it and a team of senior and intermediate power planners around the advisor. And so they've got a different experiences in different sorts of advice types. You know, yep. there's aged care specialists, there's estate planning specialists, there's insurance specialists, there's SMSF specialists. And so you're really getting that broad range of, of expertise mm. challenging the advice that you're providing. And I think that's really critical. Yeah, it is. It is actually. And and it's interesting that you could almost upskill via outsourcing. So your own your own advice can be elevated by, you know, using exactly. these technical experts, um, which we all know, I mean, a lot of that used to get provided by the product providers. You know, we'd have these numbers we could ring, but, you know, that's been, I, well, I, in my experience, it's become a little more hit and miss. You've got to know who the, who are the ones you call for and what their expertise is. So to have, you know, somewhere where it's, it's that partnership, you know, it's like a technical partnership that you feel like, hey, if I don't know or if I'm not sure, there's going to be somebody within your group that will be able to, you know, help me understand better. That's really exciting. Let's talk about client engagement. Now, I'm getting sort of a firmer picture that, you know, in terms of where you guys have decided to play or whether the tool plays is far more in the from the advisor's perspective of advice um, and what they're producing or, or providing. But you mentioned fact find and, and sort of collecting information from a client. Is that sort of the extent to which you you guys or the tool interacts with the client? Is that sort of what you limit it, limit it at? So there's a few different areas. So okay. obviously the, the Discover, which is the fact find, the digital fact find, mm-hmm. that is a tool that can actually be branded in the practice colors okay. and logo and all that sort of stuff so the advisor has a better connection with the client so yep. uh the the client feels like they're inside the practice of, of the advisor mm-hmm. but then when you get into the the compare which is the product side of things the advisor can instantly show the client their existing platform investment position against the approved product list that the advisor is allowed to advise on yeah, okay. and actually be able to give them an idea of of, of what else looks good out there yep. and not only that they can also um the old keeping up with the joneses moment where <laughs> uh you know a, 
a client might say, oh, you know, so-and-so down the road is with um, this particular platform. You can actually show the client what that looks like. Even though it might not be on your approved product list, you can still show the client exactly what that looks like. And yeah. you can do that from a platform perspective. You can do that from an investment perspective. And obviously, there's a lot of talk at the moment around different types of investments and different strategies. You know, it might be model portfolios versus SMAs versus traditional managed funds, mm-hmm. versus our managed funds, or it could be the clients are sitting, you know, tell me about sustainability. What does that look like? Yeah. And actually being able to present that and actually show the client, this is how sustainable your current investments are versus where you're going. I think that's going to become more and more prevalent. Mm. So we can really bring that to the to the fore for the advisor and the client visually. Okay. And I think that's something that's been missing. And I think, you know, compliance managers particularly have been quite, you know, frightened about this because of the way the, the law has been structured in relation to, you know, what's advice what, versus yeah. what is general, you know, those sorts of um, discussions. But then in the final part where you're actually getting into the recommendation, I think this is where it's going to get really interesting. You know, Henry talked about the time it takes to reduce an ROA, two to six hours, and then the basic SOA, eight to, you know, sort of, 12 and a half and then you know the complex you know 14 to 30 Mm. we're actually looking to reduce all of these plans down to half an hour to an hour and and this is the uh an incredible change that that i think the industry has been waiting for uh and it's one that we're um you know very very close to releasing so we're looking to release this in the first half of next year yep uh and i think that tool that allows the advisor to go from digital fact find to knowing what what strategies are eligible, being able to advise on that, and being able to produce a complex plan with all the modelling and everything within an hour, I think that's something that's never <laughs> ever been thought as feasible. Um, it's something that we've been trying to crack for a long time. You know, I had midwinter from two thousand and six to, <laughs> to two thousand and twelve, and and then Emery and I set up uh, Padua from two thousand and thirteen. So it feels like I've been trying to crack this nut for a very long time. Yeah, um, but I. I, I truly believe that that, you know, setting up the services business and the software business was the only way we were ever going to crack that nut. Yeah. And now that we've done that, um, we're reaping the benefits. We, we would say that for a very long time, you know, when you start a tech-enabled services business and your tech is starting at zero, your services are up here and your tech is <laughs> gradually getting up there. Yeah. And so, you know, we reinvested every dollar that we earned back into tech and I think, you know, we're only starting to sort of see the benefits of doing that now. Yeah. For a long time, you know, you went about going back to your earlier point. Um, how did you guys do this? We're, we're brother and sister. We must be mad to do this in the first place. <laughs> but then to actually build a, a tech enabled services business where you've got this huge tech expense that's trying to make the services more efficient, but it's not efficient until that happens. It's actually inefficient until you actually get to that mm. point where it starts to cross over. Yeah. Um, has been. Equally, uh, an insane um, thing for us to do. We're happy that we've done it, but there's been various times where Emery and I have both wanted to jump ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it is um, it is an interesting environment because you're not just trying to solve the problem in front of you. There's a lot of these other things you've got to fit within, and the legislation, all those sort of things, are examples. Whereas, you know, if you're Canva and you just need to make a small business person's life easier by having templates, then you just deeply focus on that. You know, there's, there's, I'm betting, very little other, you know, sort of challenges that they hit a wall on, whereas unfortunately in advice, just when you think you've got something cooking, there's another piece of legislation that's just going to, you know, throw a sort of a, a curveball at you. So it is, that is a challenge. I think, and I'm excited that there are more and more tools doing what you guys have done, which is let's go deep in this area. Let's just be really good at this because it means you can, like all of your energy is focused on that element. Whereas I feel like, you know, when we were trying to do everything, we just got really average at it all and even below average probably, you know, in some senses. So whereas you guys can just go deep, you know, like we're going to make this so good and you can solve that specific problem, uh, which is exciting. So I'm betting what that means is that you integrate with all sorts of things? Is that a fair assumption? What's how do you how do you approach integration? Absolutely. What are you- um, I, I like to say that um, not only are we open API, we're open to API. Right. <laughs> uh, because we there's a it. lot of there's a lot of we're open to API, but not really open no. to API in the industry. Uh, and look, we we obviously connect with um, some of the larger CRM based um, financial advice software applications. But like you said, we're we're really starting to focus now on the niche specialist players. And I think 
the ensemble advisors, uh, you know, I see this all the time on your platform. They're talking about tech stack and what they're yeah. using for the different applications. I think that's brilliant because this is actually where we need to be. And the industry has taken a long time to get there. We've we've had these generalist monolithic systems that have tried to do everything. Um, and some things have done really well, some mm. things not so well. But being able to then plug in specific applications for a particular need or requirement for your business is, is so important. Yeah. And I think you're going to see more and more and more of that. Um, I can I can say with hand on heart that Padra are never going to do anything other than advice generation. That's all we're going to do. We're never going to be a CRM. <laughs> we're never going to do portfolio management. We're never going to do practice management. Emery would kill me if I even tried. Um, so we're getting very specific and very focused, but we're going to be the best at advice. Yeah. And you know, financial advisors need to produce advice. And it's funny that we're probably, I think the only one that I that I know of anyway, and apologies if there's other applications, because we would actually support other other um, entrants to the market. Mm. But I don't think that there's any other specialist advice generation provider in the industry. Right. Um, you know, some tools are doing fact find and some tool, tools are doing, um, um, you know, objectives or goals-based sort of stuff. Yep. Uh, but- there's not really anyone that's actually focused on advice generation yeah. and trying to solve for that and solve for that alone. So, yeah, we're quite unique in the marketplace. And I think that, um, you know, picking the the tool that's the sweet spot for that particular thing you need, the power of that is we can all then have our niche clients that we want. We can build a customer experience that's unique to them and serves them beautifully and we pick the tools that work. And we can't kid ourselves that those are going to be the same tools for everybody because they're all going to be uniquely different um, and some are going to demand a client portal is the only one they, way they want to deal with this, whereas others are going to, no, 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 I always want to come to the office. Or like, you know, it, that's what the user experience is going to sort of lay out and then they pick the tools that suit that experience, you know, that really enhance it, that fit the time frame they want to deliver on and fit the team and the skills required and, you know, all that sort of thing. So I, I agree with you. I think this is the way to go. I, I understand the appeal of a, you know, one ring to rule them all, sort of one system for everything. Um, but in no other part of our world do we try and do that, you know, as evidenced by our phones. All you've got to do is look at your phone and look at how many apps are on there. There isn't one app. You know? It's one phone. There could just be one app, but there isn't, you know. So, you know, I think, I mean, there's a lot of value to integrating with all sorts of things. Is there anything you think, so for the current users of Padua, the, that you think, I can't believe they're not using this this feature or this element of the tool or even the service more like is it just i can't believe that it's it's gold you know you guys need to be doing more is there anything you'd give people a heads up on about that on the people side i would say strategy meetings and nice. calling the quality assurance managers and having a conversation with them yep right that's what i would be suggesting to our users yeah okay i like it i like it how about you matt what about on the tech yeah on the tech side i think um emory mentioned it before but the exceptions reporting some some right. um clients go oh i've already got a digital fact find and we go yeah that's great let's pull that in because actually what we're interested in is producing advice yeah and so you, you you might have a digital fact find that works really well for you and we support that we're we're big supporters of, of tech stack as you know mm. and so being able to pull that in but then saying okay this is what's missing right from your fact find or from your crm that we need in actual or you need really to produce the advice most effectively or your power planner needs to produce your advice most effectively. Yeah. That's that's really an important one. They get I think some advisors get caught up in, oh no, uh, I've got a fact fine. I don't need to use that. Yep. And we always say, No, 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 check it out because the exceptions report alone is is worth its weight in gold. Nice. And cons and consciously acknowledging again, oh, I've got this list. Hey, why is that missing? What do we need to find out? That's and once again, like the strategy list. Consciously going, yep, nope, yep, nope, with the list of things that apply to your client. That's where our smarts should be applied, not in producing the exceptions list. You know, that's not right. scanning yeah. the fact find to find the gaps. It's just, just look at the exceptions list. Just see what's missing. Don't be afraid to put the guardrails up when you're going right. 10 bowling. You're more absolutely. likely to strike. <laughs> you are. You are. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. And, and absolutely less likely to do a gutter ball. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing worse, is there? So embarrassing. No. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> what's on the development path? So what's what's down the track? What are you working towards? And what's on the, wow, we'd really love to a bit further down the track? 
Yeah, we've talked a little bit about the imminent release of, of what we call Recommend 2.0, where you're sort of taking digital fat fine and then really it's it's like a virtual tech manager in terms of allowing the advisor to have those conversations with the client about what strategies they're eligible for. Right. But really interestingly, and in the next iteration of this is is really for us, you know, what, once you know what strategies the client's eligible for, actually then mapping the strategic benefit of that strategy for the client and right. the advisor. And and so running basically optimization algorithms over the top of each strategy. Yep. And and actually plotting then saying this is the maximum benefit for this one, this is the maximum benefit for the next one, and then actually ranking them. So not only does the advisor know what strategies the client's eligible for, they know the strategic outcome of each. Yeah. And then, you know, that old alternative strategy recommendations and showing the client what they could have recommended but didn't, that becomes instantaneous and automated. So that's the next iteration for us in terms of um, uh, recommend 2.0 and then let's call it 2.1. Yep. Um, there's a bunch of other tools that we're looking to release as well. There's an insurance needs analysis, uh, personal insurance needs analysis or yep. PINA we call it internally um, that, that we've been wanting to release for a while. We're sort of been getting a lot of feedback from advisors on that and and really wanting to bring that to the fore. And I think, and again, allowing the, the client and the advisor to do the digital fact find together and then knowing immediately based on your own house rules, based on your insurance um, yep. rules that you your set. Your methodology. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so you can apply your own methodology, it automatically brings up what the, what the needs are for the client, both nice. in terms of personal and business insurance across life, TPD, trauma, income protection. Nice. I think that's um, the, the, probably the one that Emery wanted me to mention because it's been, <laughs> it's been in the development pipeline of clogging things up for a little while. We've been talking about PINA for a very long time, so I can't wait. <laughs> I'm very excited. And the Recommend 2.0 is going to be amazing for our clients, the advisors, but also for our internal services teams right. too. So we can't wait for that either. Yeah. And we're very, very looking forward to that being released next year. Very exciting. And the um, I love that there's an acronym acronym already, Pina, because um, <laughs> we don't need any more of those. To write no. To <laughs> <laughs> so the thing about insurance is if we thought people had a short attention span for wealth strategies, insurance is even worse. And I don't mean upfront. I mean ongoing. And there's very little right now that helps an advisor do that check-in. Let's just revisit this. Like, let's just take a look. What's your backup plan? Let's take a look. Maybe you can reduce your cover. Maybe you can change your terms. You know, there's very little that's doing that because it's so manual you know with your own methodology it's so manual whereas if you can do that in a faster fashion it's far more engaging for the client and they're going to be reminded of the value of the insurance you know they're going to get it and they're going to get quickly and actually it was it was the ensemble platform that that um pushed the peanut up the priority list again um peter because um there, there was there was someone mentioned you know what needs analysis tools are people using and whatnot and there was a huge amount of response from the advisors yeah. but when we, we we looked at a bunch of the the tools that people were presenting we were like actually no one has got anything like what we've created uh there's nothing that's visual nothing engaging there was a lot of spreadsheets and things like that yeah. and and um little bits of information that people were using at various um other tools which anything is better than nothing of course yeah. and so um we're not we're not but by any means disparaging those sort of um, outputs, but um, being able to have it all in one spot that's visual, that's engaging, that allows you to put your own methodology into it, I think that's what the industry is screaming out for. Absolutely, because once again, it is ultimately formulaic. We come up with our methodology and it just involves formulas. It's like humans should not be doing this. Like it's perfect for tech. Like That's exactly what tech should be doing, <laughs> you know? So I have to admit it's always frustrated me the extent to which calculations, even modeling for me, how much it's done in a somewhat manual fashion because it's numbers. Like this is computers, this is what they're made for is analysis and numbers. And so, you know, it's exciting that we're sort of moving more of that and taking advantage of the technology to do more of that for sure. So what about a wish list? What about something that you've, you know, in a few years, I'd love to be able to say we've done this. Is there anything on the radar for that? I think definitely just for us that accessibility, affordability thing is is, yep. is what we want to tackle here. Uh, obviously, we have um, wider plans in terms of taking Pedro offshore. Yep. But for now, in the short term, it's really just about um, re- dramatically reducing the time and cost uh, it, it it takes to produce high quality advice. Yeah. Uh, and I think if we can do that within the next year or two, Emery and I will be very happy and feel like we've 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 vindicated the 10 years that it's taken us to get to this point yeah 
um, and obviously the time and energy and effort to get to our various stages of technical uh, and, and para planning now before that. So I guess that, that would be it for me. Um, and, and then for us, it's about, you know, what, what does the rest of the world think of, of um, little old Padua from, from the small coastal town of Kayama? <laughs> I love it. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of what, – what, what we've discovered in our practice is you find that tool that solves a problem you have and you, <clears throat> you implement it and invariably it clarifies something you were making hard around those things, right? So it's not just the tool solving this immediate problem. It could be the way you're collecting information, the fact-finding process, or it could be, you know, like invariably it just pushes the bottleneck somewhere else. But that's good because you just keep on working on each bottleneck. And I think, I think this accessible advice thing is only going to be solved in a solving each problem approach. I just don't think there's going to be this big sweeping, this thing solves it all because we would have done it already. We would have done it already if there was one thing that could solve it. Whereas I think it is like you're saying, like, let's solve this, make the advice production as slick as it can be, you know, and then what about the other elements? What do advisors need to behave and do differently? Maybe there's more of a program that clients can go through that they can do it as part of a group. I don't know, but if we can get some of these other parts that are clunky streamlined, then it allows us as advisors to get a bit more creative on the other side. You know, we can start to think about how we can connect with more people and give them, you know, more value and more advice. So, yeah, I'm with you. I think I think the solution's there. I don't believe it's not, um, but I think, you know, nailing this will get us a long way um, to making life that much easier and therefore <laughs> cheaper. Is Absolutely. there anything we've missed? Have we missed any elements or any parts of what you guys offer? I feel like we've I think you've I covered you. almost everything. Wow. The, only, the only thing that I, um, I didn't mention that, that is really, really big um, for us is data. Right. Um, and, you know, almost from our outset, from our from our very, very early days, we ensured that the tech was capable enough to be be actually given back to our clients in, in the form of data yep. so that they could actually understand what's going right and what's going wrong with their business and actually, you know, from an advice perspective. And so... You know, one of the things that we're doing in the new year is is releasing our first um, real advice data report for advisors. So yep. it's going to be covering um, what products advisors are investing in, what strategies advisors are um, recommending, and what they're not recommending is probably uh, there's a bigger number that they're not recommending at the moment. Yeah. Uh, what advice fees advisors <laughs> are charging? You might have seen recently in the press um, some of the media publications now are quoting Pedro data in terms yep. of advice fees both upfront or initial as they call it now and ongoing yep um not only that being able to sort of give that information back to the industry and back to our advisor clients is really important to emory and i uh but equally making sure that advisors and, and compliance managers are aware of of the key risk indicators that are going on inside their business with the changes that have happened with licensees being responsible for the advice that are being provided you know you're only as strong as your weakest link um, from a licensee perspective, and and so it's really important that you use technology to really bring those alerts and notifications to um, compliance before it gets to the client. Right. So, um, you, you know, so when an advisor is making a recommendation through page with technology, you know, let's say they're outside of asset allocation ranges, or let's say that the fees are outside of allowable compliance or professional standards, we can actually alert the advisor, alert the compliance manager. And, and, and that can be fixed before it actually hits the client, which right. I think that pre-vet sort of stuff is really important to ensure that you're, you're not auditing a client after you've given them the advice. You're no. actually auditing the advice before it gets to the client. And once again, that becomes a learning and training exercise rather than a slap on the wrist. You know, and, and the way we absorb those lessons are quite different. <laughs> so so it's, it's just far more empowering for the advisor too, you know. And the data thing's interesting to me because – so we had the XYPD day, the all day PD day, and and there was a, a session on investment bonds. And it's one of those things that a lot of people aren't across. And I think, you know, the way you guys are seeing strategies that are or aren't taken up, I think is a great way even for a compliance manager to plan their training. It's like, well, hold on, we're seeing this being 
dismissed or ignored a fair bit. It could be because people aren't comfortable with it as either a product type or or a strategy. Let's run some sessions specifically on that. So I love that, you know, as an exception reporting, but also to product providers. I mean, one of the ones that I harp on a little bit about, I'll admit, is, is you know, in superannuation, choice is the thing, right? We can all choose. Unfortunately, because of pre-2015 <clears throat> allocated pensions, then a lot of not pensioners that didn't set up the account that long ago often can't afford to move because their product's grandfathered. You know, I'd love to know how many get stuck in their product. It'd be a great figure to give to the platforms to go, you guys just pitched government to change the grandfathering to be attached to the individual and not the product. You'd see all of these inflows, you know, it's that sort of information that can be really powerful because at the moment, all we've got is logic. We don't actually have volume to demonstrate the challenge. This many pensioners are paying this amount in product, old product, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, So I love that idea of that sort of overarching collection of data that would be impossible, right, right now because it's all in advisors' heads, (laughs) whereas you guys are collecting it through the system. It's incredible how much um, we rely on subjective market research and polls and we we jump in shadows from a financial services perspective oh a new poll comes out oh my god yeah but we, we kind of forget hang on how big is the sample size yep. is that actually the, the right audience to yep. be answering these questions um were they offered a rolex watch uh, to answer those questions or not in the way that they might have wanted to or whatever the case might be as has been the case in the industry in the past and, yep. and so i think for us it's all about real objective data not market research, not what an advisor or what their client or what a platform provider would have done under a certain set of circumstances, but actually what happened. And yeah. when you look at market research and the subjective stuff that is released in the industry versus the actual data and the time it takes to produce an advice is a classic one. You know, we know exactly how long it takes because we produce um, uh, advice documents every day mm. uh, for a multitude of different advisors across simple and complex as emory has gone through. Um it's incredible. We used to think, why are we taking it, you know, taking heed of these reports, which are clearly incorrect yeah. for years and years and years. And, you know, the great the great disparity was when the FSC KPMG report came out and it was three times greater than the others that were that have been released for decades and decades. And so yeah. um, I think, you know, that sort of stuff, getting back to actually, you know, using data as the information that we act on, not on surveys or polls, which may or may not be, um, accurate. Absolutely, because our memory of an experience is completely different to the reality of it. It doesn't matter how self-analytical you are, it's a- absolutely. impossible to keep all those data points in your head and connected and, and you know, corral them together. So it makes sense to get that externally. And I'm betting there's some advisors that having worked with you guys, get some insights that surprise them. You know, that for free- the number of times Emery's uh, offered employment to advisors who have said it takes them half an hour to produce a plan. You're like, <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> so we gotta, can we hire you as a power plan? Exactly. <laughs> your, your, your return rate's going to be 10 times greater than anyone else. Exactly. Unicorn, unicorn, quick. That's right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Perfect. Well, that's really fascinating. I'm so glad we caught up to um, go through the system because I just love what you guys are doing. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Padua, then the website link is in the episode show notes along with both our lovely guest LinkedIn uh, details. So feel free to sort of poke them and I'm sure they'll send you to the right person to speak to in the team. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Matt and Anne-Marie. It's been really interesting and I love that you're continuing the good fight, you know, to really streamline the production of advice. Um, I'm excited about somebody focusing on that. So those of us who are sort of EQ focused can then get on with the other stuff. So please keep it up and I look forward to seeing what adventures you get up to in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. appreciate your time. Thanks, Peter. So, are you a current user of Padua, whether it's for the tech solution or it could be for the power planning services? I love the idea that the Ensemble community and its feedback has fed directly into Padua's development path. How cool is that? Um, But I think we can do more of that, can't we? So, please share any insights you have, things you'd love it to do um, on the Ensemble community platform uh, and any tips you might give on to advisors that are considering considering it as one of the solutions um, in their sort of, you know, advice tech uh, tech stack. In terms of my thoughts, I think Padua could be a really interesting solution to consider if you're actually getting very close to or maybe you've even passed 
full capacity from an advice perspective, right? So if you're really slammed in that advice production space and you're considering your options, because while the tech itself, you know, could add some value, it could unlock some capacity for you by reducing the time it takes to produce advice. So that could be a win in, you know, step one. Um, But I also like the idea that you could then have capacity sort of on tap via the power planning services that they provide that you might just access when necessary, you know, because you're already then using the Padua tech tool, then utilizing the power planners won't be a huge leap, right? And it could be quite an easy decision you could make on the fly if you just get an influx of activity. Uh, This could mean, you know, getting over time, getting really good at delegation where you can then debate, do I assign this internally to a power planner, do it myself, or assign it externally to the Padua power planning team. So I really love that for those people in that situation. I think it could be a great solution. And Honestly, I really resonated with me the idea of a tool um, that, you know, they're continually expanding upon that sort of um, lists, you know, basically outlines all the possible advice strategies that might apply to that specific client, their age, their situation, their goals, and then prompts us to consider each of those strategies as part of the advice production process. You know, this type of rigor is not just a wonderful tool for new advisors. I think it's fantastic for experienced advisors, right? And will encourage us all to lift our game and and potentially identify areas where maybe we feel we need to re-educate or or get a better understanding because those are going to constantly happen. You know, advice is an evolving beast. So I really like the idea of those guardrails um, that can sort of keep us on track. Now, as you know, There's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. So to help you build that habit, I've got quite an interesting app for today's Curiosity Corner, and that app is Hyper History. Now, you can find it at hyperhyperhistory.com. Now, it's a really basic looking website, right? This is (laughs) nothing fancy going on here, but it's got some really interesting information available on it. So as advisors, a lot of what we do is to provide context to our clients, right? We, we remind them perhaps where they were in the past, where they are now, and even, you know, where they want to head, right? And one of the things that can help anchor those insights is what was going on in the world or around them at that point in time. And this is what hyperhistory does, right? You can pick a point in time in history and it lists by year and then even by day, potentially, global events going on, politics, entertainment, even scientific discoveries that occurred then. You know, what an interesting way to anchor that sort of, you know, normal market returns over time graph. You know, we've all seen them in an ever-increasing line, but what about adding what was going on at specific points in time? You know, the space station, the International Space Station going up in 2000 or the Kobe earthquake in 1995, or there's so many topical news items that people who've lived through those times will truly remember clear as day, right? And it'll really anchor that time in their life for them. So I'd encourage you to check the website out just to sort of provide that context to your clients when you look back in time for them, for their portfolio, or perhaps even just for markets in general. Welp, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And I'd love to hear what session or webinar you would love me to run in the future. What more would you like to learn about? What can I, you know, how can I add value in the sort of advice tech business transformation space specifically to you? What would you value? I'd love to hear all about it. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn at PeterMD, which is P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 